Wow. Okay. So good morning, everyone. And uh, we have the last day of my classes for this camp. So after that, but well, don't, don't be so sad because Adam is coming and he's also very good. And I hope that you will like his glasses. And uh, so the plan for today is we will start to cover one problem from the first day contest. Remember that we had some problems there that we have not yet considered. And those not many of you have solved, unfortunately. But it is connected to the things we have discussed in the last day, yesterday. So, uh, we will cover that problem. After that, we will cover problems from yesterday. Some of them, at least, that are most interesting. And finally, after that, as I promised, I will tell you some theory about Metroids and Metroid intersection. I will omit some proofs. You can find them on the some maybe courses of combinatorial optimization, but I will give algorithm and uh, the main ideas. And also, uh, for today, we have two options on the contest. They're both good. One is a bit harder than we had throughout the week. One is, uh, I think that this, the second one is about the same level as Tuesday contest. Tuesday contest was the easiest one, so it's the same contest, but one year before, St. Petersburg High School 2017. So it will be easier, but still good. And also I have a small gift for you. I have on the topics that we have covered, mainly on string algorithms and on uh, what we have, on uh, oh my God, <laughs> persistent data structures. Uh, we have I have contests and also on dynamic programming at tricks and advanced dynamic programming. I also have a special contest. But it's sorry, but unfortunately it's in Russian. I will translate it in the plane home. I will have plenty of time to fly 20, oh, 20, 12, fortunately, not 20, 12 hours. So I will translate. And I think in the mon on Monday or on Tuesday, they also, it also will be available. So you will be able to practice the things we have uh, considered here. And that's it. So you will have this, these three contests will be available to you on contest page selection where you have upsolving. Now you will also have three additional options to your upsolving. Two, today I will add two of them, they're already in English. And next week I will add the third one. Okay, so that's it. And let's start with analyzing one problem of the Monday contest. Remember that was Monday one day. And uh, we had a contest and we had a problem that I don't remember, maybe nobody or a few teams have both. A problem was the following. You have a square. A square. And you fill it with two by two squares. And uh, what you want to find is the number of ways to fill it uh, with one additional constraint that fillings that are the same under rotation of the square uh, must be only counted once. Correct? So that was the problem. Uh, first of all, if we remove the last constraint, if we only count distinct uh, well, fillings of the square without the requirement that two ones that can be translated, rotated to each other are the same. In this case, this is almost the same problem we have considered yesterday. Uh, we were considering childs with domino childs, remember? 
And this is almost the same tile in order to buy two squares. So we can use the profile dynamics, the borderline dynamics. So what we need to know? Again, we have a borderline and we need to know where the tiles that we have already put stick out of this borderline, yeah? So here we, again, this, here we have several options. If there is a square, if this square is covered, then actually we have no options, it's already covered. And if it is not covered, we have two options. We can skip it, say that it will remain empty. In this problem, we allow, we are allowed to leave squares empty. And otherwise we can put a square, it will go like this. So after we move the borderline to the next square, it will stick out in these three cells. So, uh, the state of our dynamic programming is like this. We, each of these squares are covered, that is what we want to know. Okay, so the problem is that those ones that can be translated to each other by rotation are considered the same in this problem. How to deal with that? To deal with that, the following combinatorial theorem will help us. It is called a Burnside Lemma. What is a Burnside Lemma? Uh, who knows the Burnside Lemma? Anybody? Well, few of them. Okay. Some of say, oh, maybe I have heard about that on my theory classes, but... Okay, so Burnside Lemma is the thing that allows you to count objects up to some equivalence relation. But not every equivalence relation is okay for Burnside Lemma. Uh, listen, consider some set of objects. Whatever objects, any objects are okay. So set of objects, we call it X. And also, we want to have a set of actions. We call it G. And we have the requirement that the set of actions forms so-called algebraic structure group. What does it mean? It means the following. First, we, may, we must be able to compose two actions. What does it mean a set of actions? Let there be an action, say A belongs to G, and let there be an object X that belongs to X. Then we say that A acts on X, and we have some other objects, object as a result. So we have A x on x, we write it just completely a x, and we have some other result from the set x. So we say that a is actually a function that takes an object and returns an object. So uh, to give you an example, consider geometry. Let x be a plane. plane, two-dimensional plane, and let G be rotations around center. So in this case, how does, what does some rotation mean? So for example, take rotation by pi divided by 2. What does that mean? We take a point, an element of x, x small, an element of x big, and we apply, rotate it by pi by 2 around the center point. We get a new, a new point. y belongs to x big. So we say that this y 
So if rotation by P divided by pi divided by two is A, so we say that Y is A applied to X. So Okay, so we want the set of action to form a group. What that mean? Let us consider a composition of actions. So we have two actions, A and B. And we say that first we make A and then we make B. Then we make A on X and we have AX and then we make B on have B. So, uh, alternatively, we can say that we make a single action, a composition of these two actions. It's called B, well, multiplied in some sense, but it's usually, I mean, this dot is usually also omitted as an ordinary multiplication. So, we just write as BA. So, we need for any two actions, the first thing we want is that the composition of these actions is also an action. So if we return to our rotations around zero, then the composition of two rotations is also a rotation by the sum of angles, yeah? So it's okay. This is satisfied. Uh, the first is, so what we need also the properties of the group well, they are usually easy to verify. The first one is associativity. So the composition doesn't matter in which order you take the composition. It is usually okay. The second one is neutral action. So we have some neutral action so that the composition with any other action is this action. So, uh, E is some do-nothing action, so we must always have a do-nothing action. And uh, the third one is that for every action there must be inverse. So you must be able to undo any action and that is also your action. So you must have A to the degree of minus one, the inverse of A. And their composition in any order must be a neutral action. So that, these are group axioms. I think that those of you who study math or who study computer science must have, might have heard about that. I don't know, program differs in different universities. It may be on the second year or the first year, but probably your, on your math classes you were told about groups. And actions additionally must satisfy two additional axioms. The fourth one is about composition. So if we take X, act by A on it, and then act by B on the result, it is the same as action with the composition of these actions on X. And the fifth axiom is that if you take a do not in action and act, then what you get, guess? You get X, yes. Yeah. So do not in action doesn't change anything. Who's gonna call me? It's I'm on classes. Okay. So if these five properties of actions and objects are satisfied, then we say that a group acts on some set of objects. So in this case, for example, the group of rotations around zero acts on points of the plane. And in our, well, what's here? Here nothing is action on anything. We say up to something. So what we can, even if we have a group that is act on a set of objects, then we can, then we can uh, 
introduce the equivalent relations equal up to an action. So we say that x is equivalent to y if there exists action A such that Ax is equal to y. Let's see that this is equivalence. Reflexivity. Why is it reflexive? Why is x equal to x? Yes, because we have do nothing action. We always have this neutral action, so E applied to x is x again. Trans uh, symmetricity is because we have an inverse of an action. So if we have a time applied to x equal to y, then we have uh, x equal to a applied, inverse of a applied to y. And finally, transitivity is also easy to check. If y is equal to ax and z is equal to by, it's equal to b a x is equal to b a x. Yeah? Okay, so this is equivalence relation up to an action. Equal up to an action. And we will now do the following. We will count objects of x up to an action. Before we do so, let's check how it corresponds to our problem. We want to find the number of fillings of this square area up to rotation. So what we need to do is to choose the set of objects, choose the set of actions, and verify that this is an action of a group on the set of objects. And what we want to do is up to this action. Well, okay, uh, we don't have options on choosing actions because in a problem we are set, count this up to this. So we must check only that this is an action of a group. If we check this and it is, then okay, we can apply this Burnside lemma that we will now check, see. If it's not, well, okay, sorry, try something else. Because you cannot choose up to what you have to count, the judges have already chosen. So in this case, you have to count up to rotations. We already know from this example that rotations of a plane form a group of action. But what about rotations of a square by 90 degrees and several times? Well, okay, this is also a group. This is actually a group that consists of four elements. Rotate by zero, rotate once, rotate twice, rotate three times. So the composition is easy. You just rotate and then rotate. You just sum up how many uh, times a uh, rotation you make modulo over four. And the inverse of zero is zero of this rotation is itself. And these are inverses of each other. So this is also a neutral action. So it's okay. And the, and the set of objects is the set of these fillings of a square with two by two squares. Okay. So uh, the classes of equivalence of this relation are called, sometimes called orbits. Orbit is equivalence class. Well, why are they called orbits? I think because of this example, actually. Because if you look at this example, and you see what is an equivalence class of points up to rotation around zero. You see that is exactly a circle around the center. So this is these points can be translated to each other by rotation, and the other points cannot be. Points that are not on the same circle cannot be. So it's like orbits of planets. Okay, so what we want to do is to count the number of orbits. 
it is denoted the set, the set of orbits is denoted as x divided by g. So in some sense, we divide our x by this action set g. So the number of orbits. Uh, so what does Bernstein lemma say? It said that the number of orbits is equal to the average number of fixed points for actions. So let's see, what is a fixed point? A fixed point is such a point that act, the action keeps it on its place. So if A is an action, then if A applied to X is equal to X, then X is called a fixed point of A. So, for every action, there can be some fixed points, and there can be, uh, well, some not fixed points, some other points that they move. So, for every action, we count the number of its fixed points, call it I of I with index A. So, I with index A is the set of X, so I let A apply checks, it keeps it. So it's the set of fixed points of A. And uh, the, so the lemma says that the number of orbits is equal to the average number of fixed points. So that's the formula. Okay, before we prove it, it's quite easy to prove. Let's see another example. This example is called necklaces. Uh, consider two types of beads. Uh, white and black. So a necklace is a sequence of beads around in a circle and their two, two necklaces are equivalent if they are equal up to circular rotation. But not flipping, so just rotation. So w w let us see how many necklaces are there. For example, for one bead, there is equal, clearly only two necklaces. Uh, for two beads, there are three necklaces, actually. This one, this one, and this one. Well, if we rotate it uh, half a circle, we get, well, the same necklace. So, the, the, this one is equal to this one. Well, uh, for four necklaces, there are, let's not uh, draw them uh, rotated, but try them around. So it's white, 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 all beads white. Then one black bead, all, there's one such necklace. Uh, two black beads, there are two such necklaces actually. They can each they can check change this one white black white black or they can go white white black black and uh, for three bits and four black bits there are also there's also one necklace so a total is six okay let's check now how can we can we can count necklaces with Burnside lemma so. Uh, the set X is the set of white of boolean vectors. So it's the set of white and black bits, but not arranged in a circle, but arranged in a line. That's X. And actions G are rotations of this set. So uh, for X, for say four bits, 
x contains how many elements? 16, yeah? 2 to the power of 4. And we know we have counted them by hand that the set of necklaces contains 16 or 6 elements. Let's see how, which actions are there. There are actions circular rotate by 0, by 1, by 2, by 3. Similar to our case of a rotation a square, actually. Okay, so let's check them one by one. So a set rotate by zero, an action rotate by zero. What are its action? Or its fixed points. What are the set of vectors of length four, so that if we rotate them by zero, that has not changed. They stay themselves. Yes, that's all of them. So its size is 16, that's all of them. Okay, now rot rotate by 1. What two actors stay the same if we rotate them by 1? Only the ones that have all the same colors, yeah. So that's, uh, its size is 2. And similarly, the size, if we rotate by 3, then the same as we rotate by 1 in the other direction. So that's also size of 2. And finally, if we rotate by 2, then all the same colors stay the same. And also, this one stays the same. Uh, and there are actually two of this. This one and black, white, black, white. And we are still not up to a rotation, but on our initial set we have two. So its size is 4. Do you understand? So I2 consists of all whites, white, black, white, black, black, white, black, white, and all blacks. These two are equivalent if we consider them up to rotation. But when we are talking about fixed points, it's still not up to rotation. It's still in the, in the original set. Okay, so if we put it to a lemma, we get the average number is 16, 2, 2, and 4, divided by 4. And uh, magically, it is 6, just as we have counted by hand. Okay, so not magically, actually, but because of a Burnside lemma. Now let's prove the, Bur the Burnside lemma, and then let's see how to use it to solve that problem. Okay, proven bird said lemma. I will give us I will give it fast. If you don't get it, you can easily check it on internet on Wikipedia, for example. Let's see. So you see, let's do the following. Let's build a table. So here are actions, here are objects. Uh, so for every action and every object, let's put the result of on this object to our uh, two-dimensional table. Then, uh, consider a column. Uh, this column gives a multi-set of its entries. So this a1 times x, a2 times x, and so on. And the last one, a k dot times applied to x. So that's not a sect, actually a multi-set. So every column contains a multi-set of values. In which cases these multi-sets for two columns are equal. If they are on the same orbit, because uh, if they have at least one common element, that means that we can transform one to another by our action. And if we cannot, then clearly they don't have any common elements. So these columns correspond to orbits, and different orbits give different multisets of values, same orbits give the same multisets of values. 
So let's keep one any column for each orbit. A an orbit can there can be several objects in the orbit. We keep any one for one for each orbit. So now we have the total number of selected cells is equal to the size of the action pad times the number of orbits. Okay, and also we have elements here. Every element is uh, occurs several times. How many times does it occur? Actually, it occurs the number of times equal to the number of actions for which it is a fixed point. So, it is the sum for all elements in our set. Uh, the number of well, the number of such actions a that a times x is x. And uh, then we write it as the sum of all elements, the sum of all actions. One, if a x is x, zero l in the other case. Swap the sums and get exactly what we need. So that is the proof of the formula. And the last thing that is left in the discussion is how to apply it to that problem. So we need to count the number of fixed points of all our four actions. Okay, for zero action, the number of fixed points is just the number of all possible fillings of the square because any filling is a fixed point of a do nothing action. So what is left is rotation and well, rotation by 180 degrees and rotation by 90 degrees. Well, okay, uh, we're using the same technique, using the same dynamic programming, but with the restrictions. So let's see, if we want to count the number of fillings that are equal up to rotation by 180 degrees. So, then, consider our square. We move our borderline again, and uh, we have some tiling already. But when we have this tiling, we also know that if we rotate by 180 degrees, we get the same thing. So we actually have a mirror borderline also going there, and we fill it like this. So they move into each other, and the only thing we need to do is to make sure that when they meet, then it's okay. Well, there are two cases actually, the size is even and the size is odd. They meet in different ways. But uh, the odd, in the odd case, the central line, uh, in the even case, we just go until the borderline is exactly in the center, and when it is, then uh, we must, uh, it must be consistent that if there is a square that is stuck up there, there must, there must be a square that is stuck up symmetrically. And in the odd case, we go until we have one line between them. And if there is a square here, then there is a square here, and we, and we only need to check that in the center everything is okay. So, there must be no square in the center. Okay, so, and uh, for these two, the number of fixed points is clearly equal because they are symmetric. And uh, how we count their number? It's in a similar way, but this time 
uh, when we put a square somewhere, it is also put here, 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 and here. So it's, we have four entries of this square. So it gets a little bit less pleasant to code, but still I have, now you have to child this part of the initial square, and you allow your squares to go through the bottom part also, through the bottom line also. And when you get to the end, you look at this and check that if you rotate, there are no conflicts. It can be done this way or that. So you actually have three uh, runs of your dynamic programming, and after each run, you check or you add a, four rotations by zero, you add it once, here you add it once, this you add twice, and you divide the result by four. That is the answer. If I, I, I don't remember, uh, it must be model or something there, I don't remember. Exactly, if this model is something, then you have to divide by four model of this, but I think the model is okay there, so you can divide it by four. Well, that is for a side story of today. Now let's have a quick quick look at yesterday's problem. Okay, what were the yesterday's problem? And the yesterday's results also are interesting. Okay, so. And Wi-Fi can pick. Wi-Fi, please come back. Okay. So Wi-Fi came back. And we can see what are the yesterday's results. So Today, we finally have a different champion, that is, des culpa a i... De... <laughs> I'm sorry, des culpa a incompelencia, are you here? Or is it a remote team? Or they just are too good to go to the classes, okay. <laughs> or they are remote, okay. Then the second place is incognito team. All right, here, okay, good job also. Okay, so we had uh, 12 problems yesterday. And uh, A and B are solved by most teams. C, uh, problem C, we need to count symmetric uh, Ferret diagrams. So, uh, what is a Ferret diagram? Is a, it's a representation of partition to terms of a given number n. So, like you say that we have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus some 6 plus 7 plus 8. And it's symmetric in a sense that if you take a look at this, it is the same. But there is no Bernstein lemma here. 
uh, although it's against symmetric, symmetric is here, and so on. So what we need to do is to count these things. Uh, so that the total number of squares is n, so representations of a number n. How can we do this? We check, let's first do the following. Uh, let's see this core square of this diagram. If we check this, then if its size is k, so what is left is some two uh, two equal uh, representations of the sum of a number n minus k square with terms up to, well, with at most k terms or terms up to k, uh, these two uh, numbers of ways are equal because it exactly corresponds to flipping the diagram. So to uh, oh, sorry, divided by 2, because we must have 2. So, uh, let's see how to find this. To find this, we use dynamic programming, count of x, t, to represent x as the sum of at most t terms. Uh, either there are fewer than t terms, in this case, we have x, t minus 1 such representations. Or there are exactly t terms. And in this case, all terms have at least, are equal to at least 1. If we reduce them by all by 1, we get a number x minus t. So plus count of x minus t, t. Well, there is a pretty standard uh, partition count dynamic program. So we will run this. So we iterate over k, and for every k, we check what is the number to represent this. Of course, we don't run this dynamic program in every time because it doesn't depend on uh, what number we're going to represent. We run it once for x up to n and t up to what? Let's say up to what? Uh, k is the number of terms that we have. It cannot be too big because we need, we cut away the square in the center. So n by, must be at least k squared. So therefore, the number the k is less than or equal to the square root of n. So t runs up to square root of n. And therefore, this whole dynamic program is n square root of n. Okay, that's it for problem C. I think no more. Ah, no, 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 don't go away. No more comments are needed. Now let's go to problem D. What is problem D? Oh, distant substrings. The problem D is interesting. One moment. Okay, so uh, the problem D, you are given some string. And you make it like this, you write down t, 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 and so on, until infinity, and you can cut away the first n character. First n characters of t. And uh, you are asked to count the number of distant substrings of these n characters. The first, uh, the first thing you do is the following. We want to remove a proper, we want to find a proper period of t if it exists and replace t with it. So if t is equal to p to the power of k, several copies of the other string, 
Then, then we replace T with P. It's clear to see that it is equivalent because if we repeat P indefinitely, then uh, the result would be the same, just every car, every K time, so we get our T. Uh, so from on now we say that T has no proper period, so it is so-called aperiodic. Now T is aperiodic. Uh, now we take the following, we want to check or find the answer. So uh, let's say land of T be L and uh, let there be uh, the land uh, M be greater or equal to 2 times L. Okay. So let's see what we have some copies of T, 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 and so maybe uh, the, the last one is not complete yet. And we have M. So I say that the following is true that uh, all substrings. Oh, let's add one more character, next character of T. Exactly L new substrings appear. Because why? Because of what? Uh, let's see. So we have this. So strings that uh, start somewhere further than... Well, all those substrings that were there before, well, okay, they were there before. Only new substrings that can appear are suffixes of this substring with this added character. So if we take a substring that ends, that every something ends here, if, if it starts in the second copy of T or later, then it was there before, just shifted by L characters back. So it was there before, it's not new. On the other case, all strings that start in the first copy of T are new. Let's see. So again, we have T, 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 and something, and the substring starts in the first copy of T. Should it be there somewhere else? Or we would have a... Uh, should it be there somewhere else? Then we would have a non-trivial value of a prefix function for... Let me check for what. So, if, 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 if... Well, okay, I, I just cannot say, but uh, the thing is, let us leave it. Uh, if the instructor doesn't remember, he leaves it as an exercise. So, he will leave it as an exercise to prove that if the, it starts in the, in the, within the first copy of okay, then if it appears somewhere else, then there is a period of t, and we have got rid of periods in the first step. No, there must be no period. So now, uh, since starting with 2L, we have exactly L new strings appear at any time. The only thing we need to do is to solve for N up to 2L. And that can be solved using prefix function, because in this case n is not up to 10 to the power of 9 or something, and you can just work with the prefix function. Every time you add a new string, you have, oh, let me say, maybe not a prefix function, but maybe something like hashes, 
So you have some new strings appear, substrings appear, so you can check them using hashes, I think. Uh, uh -huh. Or maybe T is not long there, I don't have a... Oh, it's a thousand, then you can use anything. Okay, sorry. I, I was <laughs> I was sure. Oh, okay, the T is up to what, ten to oh, one hundred thousand. Then how do you solve it for questions also? Do you need suffix array? But then it's a one thousand. Then okay. You, anyway, to solve it, and should it be up to a hundred thousand, you would use some suffix structure. For example, the suffix array that we have. Consider in a second day. Okay, so that's for problem D. Now for problem E. No, problem E was easy. Problem F. Oh, problem F, nobody even tried. Problem H. How is not equal? Well, uh, a quick note on problem H. Guys, we will have a break after we finish with yesterday's contest. It will be soon. Problem H. Uh, in problem H, you were given a way to divide some gold fairly between two persons and you were asked to divide it between among n persons so that for every pair of persons it was divided fairly in a sense described between them. Well, uh, the solution is the following. Uh, how is the goal divided? Uh, so the first one, one wants to get A, the second one wants to get B. So you run, you divide it equally until everyone gets A divided by 2. Uh, then you give all to the bigger claim until he gets B divided by 2. And then you again give them, no, not B divided by 2, by B minus A divided by 2. And then you give them equally the rest until one gets A and the one gets B. So that's how the division goes. That's in the problem state. And now we want the same thing for n persons. The solution is the following. You sort them, so you have a1 less than or equal to a2, less or equal to a3, and so on. So you start to divide until all n persons, it's difficult to draw n dimension at least. <laughs> you divide until all n persons get a1 divided by If it's not enough goal to do this, then you just give them all equal size and it's okay. Then you start, this one is waiting in the waiting room and the other ones continue to get gold until they all have A2 divided by 2. Now this one also starts waiting and the other one gets gold until they all get a3 divided by 2 and so on, until finally everyone has exactly one half of what they want to have. Uh, if you stop anywhere there, then it's the answer. I, I will prove it now, it's easy. If you came down to this point, then you actually have more than a half. And if you look at this picture, it's symmetric. So instead of that, we will, instead of dividing gold, we will divide lack of gold. So, we will go from the other side and say that we don't give you what, from what you claim, we don't give you that much until everyone doesn't have A1 divided by 2 and so on. So, uh, go from the other side. Now, from, let's check any pair of persons. So, if they both have stopped before, then they both get half of what they claim and in total they give half of what they claim. So that's exactly this point and this is fair for them. 
if they are both heaven uh, are on that side, still not completely, they get equal size. So that means that they are here. They both have fewer than the smaller of the requirements divided by two. So it's okay also. And if one is there and one is here, then again, it's quite easy to check that on this part of the segment. So, it's okay. so uh, the problem is just uh, generalize the division between two persons to n persons. So that every two are sent inversely to five so, uh, the You need to have some insight and generalize. Some of our children, well, this program has a small story. First, we had M up to 100, and we had testers. It is from our uh, regional contest. So we had testers, and testers all have solved it in the following way. Give somebody something, and while there is a pair that is not good, fix it. Uh, and it passed, and that was not what we wanted, so we increased it to 5,000, and our tester solution failed, but uh, we are still not absolutely sure that no such solution can pass. Did anybody uh, have the solution, like I said, fixed for a two until, if, until needed, well needed? No? It shouldn't have passed, but if you did, well, okay, you cheated the genus. Okay, problems. I, J, K, no, so many problems. Okay, then... Okay, let's make a short... Let's go from the other way, from the other end now. Problem L. Uh, you have an a cyclic graph and you want to color its vertices three colors. I don't remember, red, green and blue. So there were no single color path of length greater than, I don't remember, something like 42. Uh, the main idea is that 42 cube is greater or equal to the number of vertices of our graph. So, okay, I see a column of negative outcomes in this, uh, for this problem. Why is it that? Did you try the following? Try random colors. Okay, <laughs> that's exactly what we wanted not to pass, and we succeeded, I think, mostly. Okay, so uh, here we have the following, 42 to the power, uh, let's do the following, we have an acyclic graph, let's consider full the, the, the complete acyclic graph, every edge is there. So, uh, we a number of edges, one, two, three, and so on, and n, and to put every edge there. If we solve the problem for such graph, we solve it for any graph. We just remove extra edges, and if there were no path of simple color in the complete graph there, of course, is no such path in our graph. Okay, let's divide the vertices. Well, we, we color edges, yeah? Let's divide the vertices into 42 groups. Or oh, 41, I don't remember. 42. Well, I, I don't remember if we cannot have more than 42 or does anybody have a student? Because my fight game went away, went away again. Okay, okay. 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 
No more. Yes, equal is allowed. Okay, so we divide it into 42 group. And we do the following. If the age is between two different groups, then we color it red. And if it's within the same group, we still don't do it. So this way there are no red paths of length more than 42. The second step inside each of these groups, we divide the vertices into again 42 groups of almost equal size. And we color edges that are between different groups inside uh, green. And inside a single this small group, we color the edges blue. Then since 42 or 43, how much are to the power of n, to the power of 3 is greater than n, we have no paths of length. 42 or greater of green, neither blue, neither red. So, and of, you can generalize it further for multiple colors you just named. So, and for surprisingly, at first sight, for random coloring, it seems that it's very unlikely that there is a path of a single color, but since every age can belong to many possible paths, uh, it turns out that the probability that there will be a bad path is good, it, it, it is close to one. So, random shuffle solutions are difficult to get accepted. Well, okay, now, uh, problem K. If I remember correctly, uh, there, were, there was a keyboard, a set of N keyboards. And the two players had their preference. So I like the, the first player says, I like the first keyboard as A1, the second is A2, and so on, and the last one is A M. And the second player says I like the first one as a B1, B2, and so on B N. And uh, they make steps and turn and drop the least favorite and drop any keyboard until they get the there's one keyboard and that is the one they will use so the answer the question was what is the keyboard they can make sure let me check and it both play optionally yes so each one wants to maximize the value of keyboard for him Okay, so uh, let me check. This is a subtle problem in a sense that it has a heuristic solution that is correct but uh, difficult to prove and it's, diff it's different for even an odd uh, variance of n, surprisingly. And, uh, well, I have a, an analysis here as a presentation, but it's in Russian, so I don't show it to you. Um, so the presentation, just for you to understand, uh, the first slide, the solution, and then seven slides, proof. So it's some kind of problems you sometimes get at, world, uh, at the contests, hopefully not at World Finals, it would be very unfortunate to meet such problems at World Finals, where you can have an easy Solution, but difficult to prove. So the solution is that the players drop their keyboards in the following algorithm. If n is even, then the first player on his turn drops the worst keyboard for him. The second player drops the worst keyboard for him. The first again, the second, the first, second, and so on, until the last keyboard is left. That is the one. They choose. It can be proved that this is optimal for even n. Oh, for odd n, there are two ways to solve. The first one is to iterate for all keyboards of the 
the first player chooses on the first step and then do the algorithm for even n. And from one though, the first player chooses the best outcome for him. Or the second solution is, let me check, I don't remember. Okay, now, uh, it, it said that uh, it said that there is also another solution, but doesn't say which one. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. So probably to iterate over uh, the first player turn and then to solve for the even n is our way to solve. Okay, then we have two problems: J and I. Well, J and I are not that difficult, I think. They have no so, such great ideas. I think that we will do the following. We'll have a break and go to theory now, because time is running away. And we still have a lunch, a conscious and pizza today, and so many interesting things. So we don't want to skip the theory class. So let's make a break of five to ten minutes now, and go to theory, and I and J will be your exercise.
our final part of theory classes so of this week. Okay, I will uh, just give uh, make another. I uh, will repeat two announcements I made in the beginning because not everybody was here already, and also make one additional. Uh, we have the first thing is that we have two different contests today for you to choose. You have, must have chosen yesterday. If you didn't make a choice, we will print the harder version for you. And, but if you like, you can solve the easier version anyway. You just have to read online statements because uh, we could bring both for everything. Uh, the second is that today I will set up two topic specific contests for you if you would like to solve one for string algorithms, one for persistent data structures and I also have a contest for dynamic programming but it is in Russian. I will translate it to English on my way home in a plane. I will have plenty of time. So I will do it and in the be beginning to middle of yeah, next week I will set it for you. And uh, the final uh, announcement is that I am also would like to get your feedback on our uh, week and I will post a questionnaire to a system. I ask everybody to fill. You can, if you like, say who you are when asked or you can fill it anonymously. Uh, the results of this questionnaire will be known to me and I will also share them with the organizers of the camp with Rodolf and Raphael. So your feedback can be used later to set up program for other camps and even I will also oh and also I will share with, with Adam so he knew what you liked better, which types of classes, which types of countries. So okay. And now uh, go and moving on to the final uh, topic of our classes. It is as we said, it will be match rights. Uh, well, actually, I have a half semester special course for Metroids. Uh, so, of course, in one and a half hour, I will not be able to tell you everything about them. <coughs> but I will try to cover most important algorithms and statements. But mostly, there will be no exact proofs. You can check some uh, online courses or lectures. Uh, online for proofs, if you like proofs very much. So what is a Metroid? A Metroid is actually a way to generalize most greedy algorithms. So a greedy algorithm is the one. You want to build some set with some special properties. The greedy way to build it is the following. You start with an empty set and pick elements to add to your set in the following way. Pick one that has the highest possible, uh, say, uh, weight or maybe how to say, <laughs> gives you best possible advantage but keeps your set special so it doesn't become wrong. And you do it until you get the set that cannot be extended anymore and you claim this is the optimal set. It is very rare that you can do this. For example, a very known example where you can do this is spanning tree. If you know Kraskal algorithm for spanning tree, it works exactly as this. You take an empty set and you add edges in the way that you add the minimum possible edge anytime that doesn't create a cycle. So you keep your acyclic set special, in this case, is acyclic. And when you add a uh, to a set, until you cannot add any more edges, and this is your spanning tree or spanning forest, all the minimum weight, you claim this. 
So, uh, let's make a formal definition. So we have again, as we have already had today, a set of objects, call it X. Set of objects. Now we will consider a power set of X. It's, I don't, I don't know, it is denoted different in different sources. How would you like me to denote it? 2 to the power of x or p of x? What is used for the power set in Latin America? This or this? This? Okay, so the power, let's take a power set of x. That is a collection of all sets of objects. So for example, if x is a, b, c, power set of x, consists of an empty set A, B, C, A and B, and so on. So, whole collection, uh, the collection of all sets. So, some of these sets we call good or special, or officially in Metroid's theory, the term independent is used. So, we say that there are some sets that are independent. And uh, other sets are bad, not special, or dependent. Not independent or removing double, neg 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 double negation, I guess, and dependent. And we must also have some properties for a object, for a set of objects and a set of independent sets to be a metroid. These are called axioms, and there are three of them. The first one is empty set is independent. So empty set must be independent. The second property is that if some set is independent, and we take its subset, then the subset is also independent. So this property is sometimes called inheritance, so that a smaller set inherits the property of independence from the larger set. And the collection of a set of objects and the collection of independent sets that satisfies these two axioms is called an inheritance system. A system with inheritance. And the final property that we will use, that will make this inheritance system a metroid, is so-called exchange axiom. Uh, and it is uh, difficult to perceive, so please look carefully. So we take two independent sets, the big one and the small one. So they are both independent. But they have different sizes. Uh, B is big, A is small. In this case, there is always an element in the big set that is not yet in the small set, but if we add it there, it still remains independent. So there exists such element X that is in B, but not in A, that if we add X to A, it is still independent. So, if we have a set of objects and a collection of independent sets, and these three axioms are satisfied, then we say that we have a metroid. <coughs> Let's consider several examples. Thank you.
The first example will be in some sense trivial, but it will give us some, some feeling of what this axiom spin. This is called a uniform metroid. A uniform metroid is specified by two indices, M and K. And uh, it is organized as follows. The set of objects, well, actually, we don't look into the structure of these objects. We will not uh, go how these objects are organized. Sometimes notion of independence looks into them, but in uniform we don't look, so we take any n element set. For example, just numbers from 1 to n. And we say that a set is independent if it contains no more than k elements. So A is independent if its size is at most k. Okay, let's check that this is a metroid. It's quite easy. An empty set has size 0 and by definition it's at most k. If we have a set and we have a subset, if the set A here contains at most k elements, then of course the set B also contains at most k elements, so it's also independent. And finally, if we have a big set and a small set, and they're both independent, that means that they both have at most k elements, but since the smaller set has fewer elements, strictly, then there is an element that is not in the small set, and if you add it there, its size increases by one and still doesn't exceed the size of the big set, because if it was smaller, you add one, you cannot become bigger. So it's still not exceeding k. So all three axioms are satisfied. The second example that we will consider is maybe more interesting, but therefore more difficult. So let's see, it's called graphic matroid. Graphic matroid. <coughs> We have an undirected graph. G. An undirected graph G. And we use its edges as objects. So objects are edges of G. And we say that a set is independent if it is a cyclic. So if there are no cyclics, a subset of X is independent if A has no cycles. So let's take an example. So we have, say, this graph. Its edges are our objects. So we have A, B, C, D, E are objects. So the set A, B, D is independent because it has no cycles A, B, D. And the set, for example, B, C, D, E is not independent because it has a cycle B, C, D, E. B, C, D is a cycle, so it's not independent. Okay again, okay, again, let's prove that this is a metroid. Empty set is clearly a cyclic, no cycles in the empty set. And for us, if we remove some edges, of course, no cycle can appear. So the only interesting axiom is, as usually, the third one. So let's see, let's take two acyclic sets. A and B, and compare uh, and uh, check 
why there is an edge in the larger set that can be added to a smaller set, still keeping it a uh, Okay, let's see. We have some graph. Let's draw its vertices in black. And we have two sets of edges. Big B will go in blue. So we draw these edges and uh, we have some connected components. If there were n vertices and n minus one edge, there would be one connected component. But in the other case, there can be several. So we have some edges. Okay, I promised to draw vertices in black. Uh, we have some edges. Some blue edges. Some blue edges. And we have some connected components. In this picture, we have like four connected components. Uh, we also have a small set of smaller set of edges that is say we'll, we'll use red to draw it and uh, there are some edges some red edges some edges might be both red and blue so in this case we also have red connected components they are different so this is one this is two, no. and there are also single vertex components like that. So, okay, let the set B contain B edges and the set A contain A edges. And B is greater than A. That by the, by the setup of the third axiom. So let us check how many connected blue components are there if there are, if there are n vertices. If there are n vertices. Oh my god. If there are n vertices, then let's add blue edges one by one. So initially we have n vertices and they are all accompanied by a sum. When we add an edge, since the, the graph, the blue graph is acyclic, we do not, every time we connect to different components. So we reduce the number of components by one by adding every blue edge. So the total number of components in the end is n minus b. So there are n minus b blue components, and by a similar argument, there are n minus a red components. And since a is less than b, n minus b is less than n minus a. So we have fewer red, no, fewer blue components than red ones. Now, <coughs> therefore, there must exist a blue edge that connects two different red components. Because if all blue edges were inside red components, there would be at least that many blue components as red, but there are fewer. So there exists a blue edge like this one, for example, for this example, that connects two distinct red components. And if we add it to A, to the set of red edges, we still have the acyclic graph. So, the third axiom is proved. Well, it took us some uh, time now. Okay, I will now have the fourth example. The fourth example is, in some sense, contains too many matter root <laughs> parts, so it's matrix matrix. Uh, actually, a matrix matrix is from where the word Metroid went. So that was the first matrix to be investigated. The matrix matrix looks at the following. Let's have a matrix. So it has 
n rows and m column. Consider its columns as vectors in n-dimensional space. So we have m vectors from n-dimensional space. We don't care about the field over which we have the uh, vector space, but we will. I will use real numbers for this example. But if you know algebra, then you can imagine any other vector space for complex numbers or for whatever you like. So, and we say that a set of vectors is independent if it's linearly independent. Linear independent. So, uh, again, I don't know the Latin American algebra courses. How are they organized? Is it okay for you to learn about vectors? Well, I believe. A bicycle knows. Okay, so, uh, again, the, all three properties now are not very difficult to verify if it's in the empty set is linear and independent and the subset of a linear and independent set is independent. And if you have two different linearly independent sets, then the linear hull of a smaller one cannot contain all the vectors from the bigger one. So there is a bigger one that can be added. The one the vector from the bigger one that can be added to a smaller set with keeping them independent. So uh, the nice thing. So here it is quite clear from our algebra course. But a funny thing is that we can see a graphic metroid as a matrix metroid in the following sense. You might have heard about such strange thing in graphs as incidence matrix. It is a matrix of a side of a size. It has V rows and E columns, and for every edge it has a column that only has two ones in the vertices that it connects. So that's incidence matrix. It is a strange thing. Uh, I know some teachers in my childhood, they told me that it was a way to store a graph. Of course, it is a very bad way to store a graph because it's wasteful. You have always three or zeros. But uh, actually, it has nice properties, and one of them is the following. If we take a matrix matroid for this matrix, and uh, over a field of Boolean values, so you consider an edge as a vector in a v-dimensional space, but with only zeros and ones, then we would get exactly graphic matroid, because if we take some set of vectors that sums up to zero, it must be a collection of cycles, actually. Because every vertex in this set of edges must have an even degree. So, a set of vectors in incidence matrix is linearly independent if and only if it is acyclic. And therefore, we get a free proof, alternative free proof, that graphic matroid is a matroid without this consideration of connected components. But, of course, it would be a more difficult to perceive. So that's matrix matroid, and the final matroid that we will consider as an example is so-called traversal matroid. Uh, it has different possible definitions. I will give you a more uh, 
close to the terms we use at programming contests, it has some different equivalent mathematical mathematical definitions. Consider now a bipartite graph with parts x and y and the set of edges, some set of edges. So we will use the set of objects will be our left part and it is conveniently called x already. And we call a set of vertices of this part independent if so a subset of x is independent if there exists a matching in this graph that covers exactly a in the left part of course in the right part it can cover something else matching m that covers a so for example this vertex and this vertex form the independent set because if we consider this matching it covers this set but all three vertices for example are not independent because there is no matching that covers all three in D1 if we added we could add for example some other vertex here like no like this is not good like I don't know well, well we okay let me create a favorite graph of something like this so in case we have no mention that covers all three vertices in the left part for example so this set is not independent okay so again the first two axioms are trivial empty set can be covered by the empty matching and uh, a subset of a set can be covered by just dropping away the edges that are not needed anymore and the third one goes like this so say you have two sets a and some b or oh, a is smaller in our example a and some b so a is covered by some blue matching and b is a cover by some red matching let's prove that we can add a vertex to a from b that can be covered by some matching altogether how can we do this let's do our favorite operation on matchings if you have heard any lecture on matchings you know that the favorite operation matchings is take their exclusive or so you consider the their exclusive or it is a set of alternating paths yeah and cycles like this since a red matching that corresponds to a bigger set contains more edges there must be at least one augmenting chain for red matching to blue so there must be at least one chain that has alternating chain that has more red edges so both of its red and edges are red so uh, consider the vertices this vertices uh, so well let's see let's say that this is vertex from x y x y x y so uh, these vertices from x are covered by blue edges but this vertex is not covered by a blue edge because if it were covered then either it would go on there and that would not be the end or it would be the same and uh, there are two problems with that 
this vertex would have two blue edges and also this edge would have to cancel out in our XOR. So there is no blue edge, it's not covered. And if we add it to our smaller set to our cell A, then we would be able to cover it. We use the same blue edges for all other vertices and the red edges for these vertices, like alternating chain, augmenting chain algorithm for improving your match again. So we do the same, and this is the vertex that can be, this is exactly the vertex that x small from this theorem, the one that can, this x, the one that can be added to a set. Well, so many different examples, actually different by nature, this very trivial example of uniform matroid, uh, the graph matroid, the matrix matroid, and uh, very strange traversal matroid. So you see that quite often in different situations we can meet matroids. And the worst thing, if we meet matroid intersection, that we will cover a little bit later. So, what are Metroids good for? As I've told you in the beginning of the class, they are good for greedy algorithms. Let's introduce the greedy algorithm for Metroids. Uh, let's make it here. So, uh, consider a Metroid. So we have a matroid, we have a set of objects, and we have a set of, a collection of independent sets. Independent sets. Now, uh, say that every object has some cost, so, or weight. So I have weight function that gives an a real weight to every object. We have a weight of an object X, denoted as W of X. And uh, for a set of objects, we denote the weight of the set as the sum of weights of objects in the set. So weight of A is the sum of weight of X for X and A. Now what we want to do, we have a match, right? We want to find the independent set of the minimum weight. Of course, probably if the weights were positive, the minimum weight set would be just an empty set. So we want to solve a little bit more general problem for every size, for every k, we want to find the independent set of that size that has minimum weight for all values of k find mean weight set independent set of size k that's what i want to do and surprisingly, well, this all looked quite strange at first, yeah? So surprisingly, the following greedy algorithm solves the problem. We take an empty set. Well, an empty set is the only set of size 0. So if we take it, there is no other way to take a set of size 0. So it must be minimum weight set of size 0. There are no other candidates. After that, we do the following. We find the smallest weight element that can be added to our set, but keep it independent. If there is no such element, if we cannot add any element to our set by keeping it independent, we say that our set is the maximal possible size independent set. We will prove it. It's easy 
And uh, so for all possible k values, we have found the set. In the other case, we add this element, get a set of one bigger, and say that this is the best set of that size. So this very, very trivial greedy algorithm. So again, let's start. So A0, the minimum possible weight size. Uh, set of size zero is an empty set. Then I will write it in some uh, English. So while ex exists an element x such that and k is zero. So while there is an element x so that a k united with x is independent, we do the following find such x with minimum weight and say a k plus 1 is a k united with x. So the thing is that all these sets that we find and k plus plus all these sets that we find are optimal for their weight. It's easy to prove. I promise to omit proofs, but for now they are so easy that it's easier to say them than to omit them. Okay. In future we will have a verse thing that, and we will omit proofs. So, but for now they are still very easy. Okay, let's prove the greedy algorithm. The the first is okay. For zero, we have no other options. So, okay, let's say that for k, a k is optimal. Pro let's prove a k plus one is also optimal. So then by induction, every set is optimal for its size. Okay, let's take some optimal set of size k plus 1. Let b be optimal for k plus 1. Consider the, the set a k and the set b. They're both independent. And the b is greater in size than a k because b has size k plus 1. And a k is, has size k. So, by the third axiom, there exists, say, y that belongs to b but not to a k, such that a k united with y is independent. Okay. Uh, since y is the one so that if we add it to AK, we get the independent set. And X is the minimum weight element with this property. What can we say about weight of X and weight of Y? Weight of X is not great. Are you still with me? Or are you on the contest already in your mind. <laughs> okay, so X is best and Y is possible. So best is not worse than any possible. Okay, so we, we, we put it to our blue frame. Okay, now let's do a strange thing. Let's take B and remove Y. So b and remove y. What do we get? We get a k element set because it was k plus one element and we removed one. <coughs> For k element set we have a very good one. We have a k. It's optimal. So if we compare the weight of b without y and weight of a k let's write them in other order. So, 
If we compare weight of A K and weight of B without Y, we have A K not worse because it's optimal for a size K. So, okay, so let's put it in a red frame. And now the proof is almost ready. We just sum up two inequalities, the blue one and the red one. And what do we have? On the left, we have a k and x, that's a k plus one. We had add k and x. On the right, we have b without y and also y by itself. Adding them up, we get back to our b. And since these are both inequalities in the same direction, we just can write it down and get what we want. We have an op the optimal set and we have our set and our set is not worse, so it must be equal. It cannot be better than the optimal set. So it's just either the same or some other, but also optimal. So this greedy algorithm finds the optimal set for every size and in particular for the maximum for the maximum possible size of the independent set. Uh, okay, this algorithm is not very good yet. Actually, let's see. Uh, we can improve it. So this is algorithm greedy one. We will now have greedy two, the a little bit better algorithm in complexity, in, <laughs> you cannot be better than correct algorithm in your result, but you can be better in complexity. Okay, so how does it work? So let's do the following. Let's make greedy two. Step one, sort elements of x by increasing of their weight. So we sort elements of x by increasing of their weight and you know the sorted version as x1, x2 and so on, xn. So weight of x1 is not greater than weight of x2 and so on and not greater than weight of xn. And now we run almost the same but with the following optimization. So A0 is an empty set and K is zero. And now we run for I from one to N. Well, from zero to N minus one, if you prefer C style index N. <coughs> and you do the following. If AK joined with XY, XI, sorry, is independent, then, okay, you say that a k plus 1 is a k joined with x y, x i, and k is increased. If it's not independent, then you just skip it. So that's the algorithm that we call greedy 2. Well, greedy two algorithm is already very much like Kraskal algorithm. It's almost the same, just uh, instead of checking it belongs to I, we check using the joint set union if it is, uh, uh, well, if, if we can add this edge, keeping a cyclic, so that's exactly what we do. In fact, algorithm of Kraskal is this particular algorithm applied to graphic metro. So uh, the all things that I have said so far, in fact, also prove the correctness of Kraskal algorithm, although it's not, it, it probably isn't worth the, the effort, so we could prove it easier. But as a side effect, we have also proved this. So, okay, why does this algorithm work? We still need to prove it, it's easy. Uh, let's prove that it finds the same sets as greedy one algorithm. The first one is the same. Uh, the further ones are the same because of the following. 
uh, consider some elements that we have skipped here, that we couldn't add to the current set. Then we would not be able to add it at any further step. So there is no reason to consider it when looking for such x with minimum weight. Because if you cannot add it at some step, that means that, say, a k joined with some x i is not independent. But on the future steps, we have a s contain a k when s is greater than k. So a s joined with x i contains a k joined with x i. So if it were independent, then by the second axiom, this would also be independent. So for no future step, this can be independent. And therefore, there is no reason to try those x values that we have tried and didn't manage to add. So when we are looking for a minimum here, we can try only new ones. And of course, it's reasonable to try them in the increasing value of their weight. So that's exactly what we do in our greedy two algorithm. And so the time complexity of this algorithm is an n logarithm n for sorting plus n times independent check. Well, for independence check, in graphic matroid OA, for example, use, genocide, use this joint set union, and that is neglig neglig <laughs> not important compared to sorting of ages, yeah? Uh, that's so strange, so difficult. Well, I don't know how it is written, but how is it pronounced? And uh, for example, we have erased the uniform matroid. In the, the uniform matroid, Let's take this greedy two algorithm for uniform matroid. Uniform matroid uses says so that any set that has size at most k is a k. So the first k, well, say not k, we have k here. So u n m, all sets of size at most m are okay. So the first m steps here, he would add the edge. The, 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 the object to our set and go on. And starting from the next step, step m plus 1, it will not add anything. So we have a, a very great claim that <laughs> the optimal set of size at most k with no additional restriction is to take k smallest weight element. Well, that's good that we have this, because if we had something else, that would be suspicious. So for trivial case, our algorithm is correct. Uh, that's good. Now, for matrix metroid, for matrix metroid, it is a little bit more difficult to understand what we're going to do. So we have, again, some vectors. And we want to find independent sets of all sizes. Well, actually, usually you don't need those all sizes, but only the maximum size, of course. So you want to find the basis in some sense. That has the minimum cost. And it turns out that you can do it greedily by sorting your possible vectors by weight and adding them one after another and checking if I this vector is okay. If you still have a linearly independent set, then you add it. If it's not, you don't add it. And uh, finally, for the, <coughs> for the traversal metric, uh, it allows us to solve the following problem. We have uh, set well, well, we have a bipartite graph and we want to find a matching a weight matching but weight in a special sense 
the weight of the inch only depends on its left end. So how do you usually set assignment problem? Like you have jobs, you have workers, and for every worker and every job, you know the cost of doing that job with that worker. And what you want to do is to minimize the total cost of doing so all jobs. Uh, in this example, you can get a bit, a little bit relaxed addition so that you have jobs, you have workers. For every worker, you know if it is able to do this job. And also, either for there are two settings, both are reasonable. Or you have a salary for every worker, you can give him any job, but the salary of this of different workers is different. And again, you must choose a set of workers to do all jobs with a minimum total cost. The other setting is also reasonable. I have a set of jobs and a set of worker, workers, and for every job, you know, it's cost, no matter what, which worker is going to do it. And again, you want to do all jobs with the minimal cost. So, uh, in, a, in either setting, you can use any simple non-weight matching algorithm, Kuhn algorithm, for example, combined with the Metroid idea. So you just run DFS looking for augmented chains, not in arbitrary order as you do in Kuhn, but in increasing cost order. And the matching you find optimizes the sum of ways of its left side of those parts that you run DFS from. So you get this. So that's greedy algorithm for my choice. It is sometimes also called Rado Edmonds algorithm. But more usually just a greedy algorithm. For metroid. Well, okay, that was a good part <laughs> of metroid's lecture. The metroids, they are easy actually, they are nice. Uh, if you want to know, there are actually not very many metroids that you can meet, but besides these ones, there are also some scheduling problem, problems that reduce to metroids and also some. Uh, so-called arborescence is a, out, a directed tree. So uh, arborescences in graphs are also connected to metroids in some sense. So, but what we're gonna do now, we're gonna talk a little bit without, now I told you I will not give proofs, but I gave you all proofs. I was I lied. Actually, I was not lying. I just didn't tell you all the truth. Uh, because now I will go on to Metroid intersection, and this time I will not give proofs because there is actually some twenty lemma or theorems that we would need should we decide to prove everything. So I will give you the no, the definitions and the algorithm, and some reasoning about it. So, Metroid intersection. Well, some students couldn't stand Metroids, as I see, okay. So what is a Metroid intersection? Consider two Metroids, M1, with a set of objects S, X, and set of independent, a collection of independent sets I1, and Metroid 2, with the same set of objects, but different notion of independence. So, uh, a good example is the following. Consider a graph with colored edges. So you have say a graph 
with four vertices and different edges and something like that. So different edges can have different colors. So we could uh, set two metroids on edges of this graph. One, for example, would be our traditional graphic metroid. When we say that the set is independent, if it uh, is a cyclic. The other one could be, for example, a uh, so-called rainbow metroid. Uh, a set is independent in a rainbow metroid if all colors of objects in the set are different. It is easy to prove that it is a metroid. I leave it as a negative size for you. So, a rainbow metroid on the set of edges. So, in so let's see. For example, let's give names to our edges A, B, C, D, E. So, for example, the set A, B, C is uh, independent in both metroids. It's acyclic and it's rainbow. A set B, C, D is bad in both metroids. It's not a cyclic, it's a cycle, and it has two blue edges. A set A, D, E is a rainbow, but not a cyclic, for example. And a set A, B, D, for example, is a cyclic, but not a rainbow. So this, there are all possible combinations in this graph. Uh, for three, for uh, sets of size of three. So we say that a metroid intersection is the combinatorial object, M1 intersected with M2, com consi that consists of the, uh, that also we have a set of objects, and we say that independent are those objects that are independent in both of our original two metroids. So that is a metroid intersection. So metroid intersection is inheritance system. The first two axioms of metroids are okay. Empty set is independent in both metroids, so it's independent in the intersection. And a subset of the independent set, if we consider one, so <coughs> we have the first uh, it, uh, let's say that we have a set that is independent in both metroids. The, and B is a subset. Then again, B is independent in the first metroid, and B is independent in the second metroid because of the second axiom in both of them. So it's independent in the intersection as well. But, unfortunately, that third axiom is not true uh, because it is sometimes not possible to add uh, the element from the bigger set to the smaller one. As an example, let's say that this example take the first set A, D. It is independent in both. And take the second set S, A, B, E. It's also independent in both. But there is no element in the bigger set that you can add to a smaller one. If you try to add B, you get A, B, D, and this is not rainbow. B and D have the same colors. And if you try to add E, you get rainbow set A, D, E, but not a cyclic because A, D, E is a second. So the third axiom, the exchange axiom, is not true for metro intersection. Therefore, the greedy algorithm that's so beloved by us, so very nice, <laughs> greedy algorithm doesn't work. And even more of that, uh, the greedy algorithm and algorithm for, without weight. So if we remove weights from our uh, objects, then this greedy element, well, or greedy algorithm, well, it finds optimal set for every size, and I say that at, at least it finds sets of any size, because you can always add an element if there is a bigger size set. 
But here, should we run algorithm in the first peak A and then peak D, then it is, well, in this case it is not stuck, but if we remove C, for example, it is stuck. It cannot add neither B nor E to increase. Although there is a three element set called say B, A, B, E. But A, D cannot be improved to it. So the Metroid intersection is not a Metroid, so greedy doesn't work, but maybe something works. The answer is yes, there is the algorithm to build the, uh, at least the largest unweight independent set in Metroid intersection. We will now consider this algorithm and I will also give some details on how, why it works, although the formal proof is quite long, not because it is difficult, but there are many notions connected with Metroids that need to be introduced and we don't have time. So, we want to solve the following problem. We have two Metroids and we want to find the maximum size set that is independent in both metroids. Okay, let's start with greedy approach. So, while we start with an empty set, it is clearly independent in both metroids. And why there is at least one element that can be added to our set, so that it is still independent in both metroids, we do add this element. So now we have a situation when we are stuck. There is, there is no way to add the new element to our set. Now we have to do something more difficult to modify it. Maybe like the, here we need to, for example, we are in AD, say we have, and we want to move to ABE. So we need to drop something out like D here and add instead two other elements. Or maybe, in general case, drop three elements and add four or something like that. There is a way to do this that is in some sense similar to matching improvement algorithm, Kuhn algorithm something, or something like that. It is similar but different. So, let's see. Uh, so, now we have some independent set A, that consists of some objects of our X set. We will then draw an example there. And we also have other objects that are not in our set A yet. Uh, let's build the following directed bipartite graph. <coughs> It's called exchange graph. We will build an NH from X to Y if removing X from A and adding Y instead creates an independent set in the first, keeps independence of this set in the first metroid. If A remove X add Y is independent in the first metroid. So in this case we draw the edge from left to right. Uh, we draw the edge from right to left, from U to V, say if removing U from A and adding V keeps independency in the second metroid. Like A minus U at the V is independent in the second metroid. Well, we need to have braces on this. Okay, let's try and do it here. So we have A equal to A and D 
And we have also two other objects, P and E. Well, if we remove A, we get D. And in the first metroid, we can add both B and E, and that would be acyclic. So from A, we draw edges to both B and E. If we remove A and uh, try to add B or E in the second metroid, we see that adding E is okay, but adding B is not okay because we will have two blue edges. So we only draw from E to A. Now D. Removing D, we have A, and anything can be added. We can add both B and A in either of the metroids. So we connect D to B in both directions and with E in both directions. So we have this graph, has really, really very many edges, but still. Okay, so we build this graph. Looks in some way, so there is some way it looks. Graph and graph. So now the next step is we create two sets. The set S is the set of elements that can be added to A, keeping independence in the first metroid. So S is the set of elements X such that A joined with X is independent in the first metroid. Now we draw, we also create the set T That is the set of elements such that adding them to the set A keeps independence in the second metroid. So T is the, num is the set of elements, so that joining them to A is independent in the second metroid. Uh, S and T do not have common elements because if they had we could continue the greedy part. We could add this element to our A by keeping independence in both, and we claim that there is no way to do it. Uh, now let's take some element X and add from S and try to add it to our A. Okay, we keep independence in the first metroid, but we don't have independence in the second metroid anymore. Okay, let's look at the edge from X to the left part. Well, this is element that if we remove it, we keep independence in the second metroid. And removing always keeps independence in the first also because of the second X. Great. So now, okay, let's look uh, at some edge going from this element. Uh, removing this element, but adding some element on the end of the edge, keeps independence in the first match, right? So, okay, let's try to add this one. Or maybe there is some edge going out of this one, adding this element and removing the end of that edge, keeps independence in the second match, right? And so on, until we come probably to T. Now, for every particular edge on our path, so we have a path from S to T actually in our graph. For every particular edge in our path, if we add the right end of this edge and remove the left end of this edge, we keep independence in, well, uh, for edges going from left to right in the first metroid, from edges going from right to left in the second metroid. Uh, and for our endpoints, just adding this keeps independence in the first, just adding this keeps independence in the second. 
This gives us the idea that if we take some path from S to T, then probably, well, all these actions separately are allowed, but why are they all allowed as a combination? Maybe when we do all of this, we get the best set. But well, maybe, we hope, maybe some smart people made 20 theorems and proved that this is okay to do this all at, at once. The answer is, unfortunately, no. It is not allowed in general. If we do this, we can lose independence in one or both measurements. But, surprising fact is that, if we do so, uh, but take the shortest path from S to T, then, and it can be proved, uh, we do keep independence in both metroids, and so we may take the shortest path from S to T. This example is, in this example we probably have one of the possible shortest paths. Uh, and uh, remove from A its left vertices, add to A its right vertices, then the new set is independent in both measurements. So take shortest path. From S to T and change A by removing left vertices of P, texture of P, adding right vertices of P. Okay, the, uh, the approximate idea how it is proved is the following. We take th this path, the shortest path. Uh, if we only keep vertices of this path and also some auxiliary vertex uh, for parity so that it had the same number on the left and right, let me not get too far to it, we would get a graph that has a single uh, single complete match, single perfect match, so that uh, it doesn't have more than one perfect match. And then it can be proved that if an XOR graph on two sides of equal silence has a single, a unique perfect match, then so XOR then if one set is independent, the other set is also independent. And that can be proved using the fact that if there is a unique perfect mention, then the recital network for this mention is a cyclic, so there is a topological sorting on this network. And this allows some induction that breaks away if there is a multiple mentions, if there are multiple mentions. So that's something like that. Uh, it would take us, I think, some uh, several hours to introduce everything and prove this completely. But for short, uh, the algorithm is the following. So you build a set starting from MT1, adding vertices, adding objects greedily while you can. After you cannot add objects greedily anymore, you build the exchange graph, introduce sets S and T. If one of these sets is empty, then you clearly have the longest, the, the greatest size uh, independent set in one of the graph, in one of the metroids. So you clearly cannot improve it. If it is not empty, if both of them are not empty, you try to find the path from S to T. It can be proved that if there is no path, then 
A cannot be improved. A is the maximum size uh, uh, independent side in the intersection. If you find the path, then take the shortest path. So use BFS, not DFS, to find this path. And uh, exchange vertices, remove left part vertices from this path, and add right part vertices, and you keep independence. Let's see on this example. So we say, say we add, so S. S is adding with a cyclic, uh, keeping a cyclic. AD, we can add B, but cannot add E. So this is S. T. T is <coughs> adding to AD and keeping rainbow property, but not necessarily a cyclic. So B cannot be added because D is also blue, but E can be added. So this is T. And the shortest and actually the only part path from S to T is S D E. Is B D E. So you remove B D from the set and add B and E and get A B E as promised. Uh, the time complexity, uh, as another note on this algorithm is that actually the first greedy part is just an optimization, but actually if S and T have a vertex in common, which is the case if there is still ability to greedily increase R set, then the shortest path from S to T is just zero length in this vertex, so usually well, you can ignore this special case and not run greedy part, but oh, in actual problems on this topic, uh, sometimes this non-asymptotic improvement is useful. So after that, you do these steps while well, possible. Create this graph. It is a rather expensive operation, actually, to create this graph, because for each edge, you need to check an independence and the, the, the bad thing is that uh, it's usually for most uh, metroids you would meet, checking independency when you add elements only is easy. For example, for, graph metro, for graphic metroid, you can use disjoint set union. For uh, metrics metroid, you can use Gauss algorithm for some travel so much right you can use machine cool algorithm but removing uh, an element from the set is uh, usually not very easy so it's uh, this part is actually you must sometimes this the matroid intersection algorithm itself is easy just BFS but the trick is to build the graph in fast way so uh, in I, I know approximately, I think, three or four problems of this type, and the most problem is usually to build a graph efficiently. So you build exchange graph efficiently, and then you can check for the shortest path. So building graph at most n times where n is the size of the set, this is the most expensive part. That's why the greedy part is preferential while you can do, really do it. <coughs> okay. And the final note on metroids that, and metroid intersection that I would like to tell you, it, the final two notes are the following. The note number one. Note number one, intersection three metroids. Well, uh, we had so many troubles intersecting two. But, uh, intersecting three seems frightening, and that's true. That is not easy to do. Probably it's very difficult to do because it's NP complete. And you can state a Hamiltonian path problem as the problem about intersecting three metroids. Consider the following 
Consider the following. Let's take a directed graph. G. And the following three metroids on it. Metroid number one is a rainbow metroid and the color of the edge is the number of its initial vertex. So color of UV is U. Metroid number two is the rainbow metroid on this graph. Again, but the color of the edge is the, the number of its last word, of its end word. So the color of UV edge is V. And the third metroid we obtain in the following way. We forget about the direction of our edges. We forget the direction of the edges. And just take the graphic metroid on a symmetrized graph. We forget the direction, we build undirected, G undirected, and claim that sets are independent if they are a second. So, I say that, uh, let's look how do the independent in all three metro sets look like. From every vertex, there is at most one edge that goes away, at most one edge that enters it. So it's the collection of paths and cycles for the first two metroids. And the third metroid adds that there are no cycles. cycles. So it's just the collection of paths. And the collection of paths of maximal number of edges is therefore the minimum number of paths. So if there is so, no, no, if there is a Hamiltonian path in G, if and only if, uh, the maximum car size set independent in all three materials has size n minus 1. So we have reduced the problem of finding Hamilton and path to the problem of finding the maximum size set in the intersection of three metroids and therefore we have a strong belief that uh, three metroids cannot be efficiently intersected. Well, that's note number one. Now, now number two. Let's find the place for it. Here, I think. Uh, now, number two. Metroid Union. Uh, consider the following problem. You have a graph, undirected one, undirected graph, and you want to find you want to find two non-intersecting spanning trees. So, uh, in general, you have a set of objects, and you have several metroids there. And you want to find, uh, you have a set of objects, X, you have two notions of independence, I1 and A2, I2, and you want to find two independent sets, one independent in the first sense, one independent in the second sense, and uh, they do not intersect and their total size is greatest possible. So it's like when you have one metroid, you want to find the maximum size set. That's what the greedy algorithm does. 
and they even can uh, we, we even can add weights. But now we want to find two independent sets, but not intersecting of the greatest common set. Now that I one and I two do not interact in this case, unlike in the intersection case, you just have two parts, one independent in the first sense, one in the second. So, for example, we could use the same notion, and we would get, for example, what I told before about two spanning trees. If we take graphic metroid, and both I one and I two are acyclic, this question states that what we want is to find two spanning trees. Well, with two acyclic sets, they do not intersect and maximal possible cardinality. The maximal two theoretically possible cardinality is uh, uh, twice spanning tree. Yeah? So if we solve this problem, we could also solve the two spanning trees problem. Uh, this problem can be reduced to Metroid intersection in the following way. Let's have two copies of each element in our X set. One blue one. So X1, X2, and Xn blue. And one red. X1, X2, Xn. And now let us introduce two metroids. The first one is uh, it has uh, this blue x blue uni united with x red set of objects. And the set is independent if its blue part is independent and its red part is independent. It is easy, quite easy to prove that this is a metroid if blue and red parts are metroid. So the set is independent, is <laughs> checked independently, I'm sorry, for blue and red parts. And the second metroid Uh, says is a rainbow metroid that says that we cannot pick both red and blue ele element for some, for some ice. So we cannot we say that x the set A is independent if it doesn't contain doesn't chain both blue and red copies of some element. It is a rainbow metroid. The color is the number of the element, unlike the color, the, the actual color that we have, which is blue and red. The color for this, for, for uh, the the matter of this metroid, the color and the number of the elements. So the first metroid independently checks for independence of blue and red, and the second one doesn't allow us to have both blue and red of some element. So oh, it's easy to check now that the set is independent in both metroids if it is exactly what the metroid union requires. If it has independent two parts, then they do not intersect. The first one is for this, and the second one is for this. And therefore, the maximum size set in this intersection corresponds to the maximum size in the Metroid Union. Therefore, you can solve, for example, the problem that I have described about two span entries. And the final note before we go to lunch is that unlike Metroid intersection, Metroid union can be made for any number of Metroids. If we, but we don't have a green marker, but should we have and then I3. So we would add X, well, we have black one here. Yeah? 
So we have we add the black copy of each element again, and now we say that the same thing. Uh, M1 checks. for independence separately for each color and then two ensures that each element contain, is contained in exactly one of the parts. So that's for three, for four and for any. So you can find four examples using this you can find the maximum number of spanning trees non-intersection in the graph. One example of such problem. Okay, a little bit uh, difficult theory today, but I hope that it was interesting. At least I think it was. It must have been new for most of you. So, and uh, who knows? We didn't have a Metroid intersection problem at last world final, so who knows what it comes back? Judges know, but they won't tell. So, and we won't tell. <coughs> So that's it for this theory classes of this week. Thank you very much for coming here to this camp. It was nice for me to teach you. Please fill the questionnaire in the system that I will post you. And good luck at today's contest and on the second week. Okay, it was nice to meet you all. Thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, you can come now or after the theory today, or after the conscious today, we have pizza party and I will be there. So that was, it will be your last chance for this camp to ask me in person. After that, I go home slowly. <laughs> and uh, uh, But I'm still available on uh, email. So. Okay, thank you and have a good lunch and contest.